Hello guys, we are back. Yes, uh, sorry for the uh, leave of absence. Uh, things were happening in private life that needed sorting and uh, I was in the process of getting a new setup belt. As you can hear, I am no longer speaking to you through a toilet bowl. Um, I am a lot clearer. Um, yeah, new microphone, new setup. We're good to go and hopefully this should be coming out at a more routine rate than it has been. So I do apologize for the absence. Um, but regardless of that, uh, we're moving on to the Panzer Jaeger 1, which is an interesting little tank destroyer. So the Panzer Jaeger 1 is, it can be considered by many to be the German Army's first real attempt at what could, uh, Panzer Jaeger, which is a tank destroyer or tank hunter. Um, at the time that the, the tank is produced, uh, there is a there is a trait that will follow the German army throughout the rest of the war. So, the Germans start the war with the Panzer I in service. Now, the Panzer I is a very short, very poorly armed light tank, which is meant to be used as a training tank where other tanks come online, but the Germans have been forced to thrust them into service in the early war period because they don't quite have the new tanks that they want. They see good service um, in Poland, but uh, very quickly it becomes apparent that the double armed machine guns of the vehicle are just not going to cut the job that they want anymore. And so it's decided that they are going to convert the vehicles into a form of tank destroyer. Um, it's decided in late 1939 that they're going to start mounting the, the Czechoslovakian 4.7cm KPUV VZ38 gun. In German designation this is the 4.7cm Pak T anti-tank gun. Uh, T uh, is the German designation for Czechoslovakian weapons. That's why you have things like the Panzer 38T and the Panzer 35T. Um, it was originally it was intended to use the 3.7 centimeter Pack 36 anti-tank gun, but even by this point, it was becoming clear that the 37 millimeter was no longer going to be an effective weapon, and so the 4.7 was picked as the ideal choice to replace uh, the Panzer One's very meager armament of two MG15 machine guns. Uh, so. Uh, in, initially, the, the Panzer I turret is removed, and a fixed gun shield is added to protect the armament and the crew. This is the era when, um, really, it's a case of we need to get these things into the field, we can't develop anything on the permanent, and so subsequently the a gun shield is simply added because it's cheap, it's effective, and we can get it on there in absolutely no time. The anti-tank gun is mounted on a pedestal in the fighting compartment after wheels, axle and the trials were removed, but the original gun shield is retained. Um, it normally carried 30, uh, 74 anti-tank shells and 10 HE rounds. Uh, Alket and contractors built uh, 202 of these vehicles. The first series of 132 were built by Alket in 1940. Ten of the second series of 70 were also assembled by Alkek, while the rest were assembled by the Kogner Humboldt Deutsch in 1940-1941. The first five, uh, the first series had five uh, shield, five-sided shields. Sorry, the vehicles in the second series are recognisable by their seven-sided gun shield. So the formal name for the vehicle was the 4.7 centimeter uh, Pak TSF. Auf Panzerkampfwagen von Untrum, translating as 4.7 cm anti tank gun, Czech self propelled on turretless Panzerkampfwagen 1. Germany, why does everything need to be so complicated? Um, the armor uh, varied significantly um, after the rework. The hull would remain uh, at 30mm on the front side and rear. This is equivalent to just over half an inch in thickness. These things were not very well armed at all, and it begins the trait of the German army building very lightly armed but heavily armed tank destroyers. And the 4.7 centimeter gun at this point is one of the best guns in the German army, which is fitted to armored vehicles. It is, a, and as we'll get onto, it's a very, very effective work. 
the gun shield itself is 14.5 millimeters in thickness and this has been specifically built like this because the Germans are aware of things like the boys anti-tank rifles um, which are used by the British the Poles used anti-tank rifles in against them in the winter camp and uh, in the September campaign sorry and they discovered very very quickly that the Poles were very very good at knocking out German vehicles with these guns by simply aiming for weak points in the armor that they were aware of so they make sure to try and make to allow the frontal gun shield to have enough armor on it so that the crews can be protected from at the very least uh, anti-tank guns and small arms fire and with the British using uh, the 303 round 14.5 millimeters will genuinely be enough to stop them though um, it is very clear to know that a boy's anti-tank rifle will punch straight through that without too much uh, issue in terms of organization the Panzerjägers were organized into companies of nine with three companies per battalion the only exception to this is during the French campaign when anti-tank battalion a Panzerjäger Abteilung 521 had just six vehicles per company um, though the battalion strength remained the, uh, the, the uh, companies per battalion remained the same for the remainder of the war they were used solely by independent anti-tank battalions with two exceptions uh, post the Borkland campaign one of these companies is assigned to the SS Brigade Leibstandarte uh, SS Adolf Hitler uh, prior to it becoming a full-on division and the other is the Panzerjäger Abteilung 900 of the Lehr Brigade of the, nine, of the 900th Motorized Training Brigade which was used in the build-up for Operation Barbarossa. In terms of combat history Anti-Tank Battalions 521, 616, 643 and seven, uh, 670 sorry, had 99 vehicles in the Battle of France. Only Anti-Tank Battalion 521 participated in the campaign from the beginning and the other threes were still in training until a few days after the campaign began, but were sent to the front as soon as training had finished. 27 Panzerjäger 1s equipped an Anti-Tank Battalion 605 in North Africa. It arrived in Tripoli, Libya between the 18th and the 21st of March 1941. Five replacements were sent in September, but only three arrived on the 2nd of October, the others being sunk on board the freighter Castagno uh, by the British. At the start of the British Operation Crusader, the battalion was at full strength, but lost 13 vehicles during the battle. Four more replacements were sent in January 1942, that said it might muster 17 for the beginning of the Battle of um, uh, Kazala. Despite the shipment, another three vehicles from September to October 1942, the battalion only had 11 by the beginning of the Second Battle of El Alamein. The last two replacements were received by the battalion in November of 1942. Anti-tank battalions 521, 529, 616, 643 and 670 were equipped with a total of 135 Panzerjäger 1s for Operation Barbarossa. They were assigned as given below for the opening stages of the battle. So, so uh, Abteilung 521 was assigned to 14th Corps as part of the 2nd Panzer Army for Armoured Group Centre. 529 was assigned to 7th Corps as, as part of the 4th Army for Army Group Centre. 643, which was uh, attached to, uh, I believe that is Corps 39, which was motorised from the 3rd Panzer Group as part of Army Group Centre. Army Group North had the 600 at uh, the 616th Corps, uh, Abteilung, sorry, which was part of the 4th Panzer Group, and Army Group South had the 670th, which was part of the 1st Panzer Group of Army Group South. By the 27th of July 1941, Abteilung 529, which is part of 7th Corps of the 4th Army, had lost four Panzerjäger 1 vehicles. On the 23rd of November, it reported that it had 16 vehicles, although two were, were not operational. On the 5th of May 1942, Battalion 521, which was assigned to the 2nd Panzer Group, reported that only five vehicles of those still existed. Uh, Abteilung 529 had only two on strength when it was disbanded on the 30th of June 1942. Abteilung 616 seemed to have been the exception as it's reported that all three companies were equipped with Panzerjäger 1s during mid to late 1942. Um, this isn't this is a bit of a surprise for a uh, for no, so this is not a surprise for 616 as 616 was assigned to Army Group North uh, which had a relatively easy time punching through the Borklands and there was very little Soviet armor up there which could really have given them a problem 
So there is a couple of combat assessments which are given uh, by the 643, uh, 521 and 605 Abteilungs uh, during the campaigns between uh, in France and Russia. Abteilung 643 uh, gives this assessment on the 25th of July 1940. Quote, the 4.7 centimeter armor piercing shells were effective against 45 to 50 millimeters thick armor at ranges up to 500 meters. Observations was limited. The crew, with the exception of the driver, had to look over the gun shield to observe what was in front of the Panzerjäger 1, resulting in exposure of body parts to potential damage, namely shots to the head. In effect, the crew behind the gun shield were blind in urban combat, suppressing fire and individual tanks. Uh, skipping quickly to uh, the July 1942 report from the 605th Abteilung, Quote, the accuracy of the weapon was commented on as as it will usually hit its target with the first shot at ranges up to 1,000 meters or 1,100 yards. However, its penetration qualities were far too low for the necessary combat ranges in the deserts of North Africa. The chassis, engine and suspension were constantly in need of care due to the additional weight of the anti-tank gun. In one case, three Mark II Matildas were penetrated at a range of 400 meters by, by 4.7 cm tungsten core armor piercing shells no more predominantly to us as Panzer Granat 40. It usually penetrates 60 millimeters of armor, close to 2.4 inches. Therefore, a small percentage of these runs are desired. The 4.7 centimeter armor piercing shell will not penetrate a Mark II at 600 to 800 meters, but the crew will abandon the tank because of fragments spat off the armor on the inside. Matildas at this point are not very well built. So, in total, the Panzer Jäger 1 is a, a successful, even if it is a rather unusually successful vehicle for its time, uh, the Panzerjäger is not slow. Its remark is rather decent. Uh, it's tall, uh, at a height of a uh, seven foot. It's not exactly a small vehicle. I mean, I'm I'm six foot and I'm not exactly short. Um, it is this trend that begins from the German army of having of taking uh, existing vehicles which are deemed obsolete and returning them to service as something very decent. Uh, say 202 Panzer Jäger 1s are built off of the chassis of, of existing Panzer 1s. And as we move on throughout the series we'll see things like Panzer 2s and Marders and Panzer 3s all eventually finding their way into the anti-tank role through the fact that they just become obsolete and the Germans convert them. Um, in total, my personal opinion on the Panzerjäger 1 is that it is a highly effective light tank destroyer and should not be underestimated by anyone regarding the vehicle. Yes, it does have its weaknesses. Yes, the crew inside are basically blind as bats. Yes, anyone with a decent enough Bren gun aim can pretty much suppress the crew into keeping them hidden and not being able to return fire. Yes, even a half-decent Tommy with a, with a rifle can pick a man's head off while he's trying to scare the target. But against armoured engagements, especially in France and on the Eastern Front, this vehicle proved to be highly efficient. And at a time on the Eastern Front, when most vehicles couldn't penetrate the front of a T-34 from distance, this would have been very, very appreciated. Anyway, uh, that is my f uh, final report on the Panzerjäger 1. Uh, just a quick side note, I would like to thank everyone who has supported me on the previous videos. Uh, this will now become a routine thing, we're finally getting them back out, we're the setup is complete, we're going to be getting them going, we're going to be getting them rolling, and yeah, you'll be hearing from me very, very shortly again. So again, uh, like, uh, subscribe, uh, comment down below what you want to see as well. I'm not just going off a list that I've got written, uh, I want to hear what you guys want to see. Uh, so yes, thank you very much guys, and I will see you on the next one.